And we're going to read the opening 12 verses together. And when he, that is the Lord Jesus, returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic son, Your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming who can forgive sins but God alone. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he arose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Amen. This is God's word. Join with me in a little word of prayer as we come to God's truth this morning. Father, we thank you we're here. We're here with hearts that are desirous to hear from you because we need to hear from you today. We've been out in the world and we've been out, Lord, in the company of those who don't know you and surrounded, Lord, by a hostile environment on a constant and daily basis. Sometimes our spirits get a little worn and our hearts grow cold and distant. But Lord, we thank you that you have ordained that we come together and the assembling of your people together is a great means whereby grace, so needful, can be again received by us. Thank you, Lord, for the word. The word is power. The word is life. The word produces in us that which is pleasing in your sight. And so, Lord, we've come to sit at your feet like Mary and hear your word. And we pray that, Lord, you will grant that we'll have minds to understand it and hearts, O oh God, to embrace it with joy that it might be lived out in our lives and that in truth men and women will take knowledge of us that we have been with Jesus. We ask it in his worthy name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. The last words that our Lord Jesus spoke to his disciples ere he ascended to the right hand of his Father are words which I am sure are familiar to us all that we refer to as the Great Commission. When he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And eagerly they followed the precept of their ascended Lord and following the very program which he gave to them, recorded for us in the first chapter of the book of Acts, they went forth into the streets of Jerusalem and then into the province of Judea and then into Samaria and from there out to the Gentiles and the uttermost parts of the world. And God gave great success to the preaching of the gospel. God bore them witness, we read in Hebrews chapter 1, with signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Ghost. But he also bore witness to the authenticity of the word that they were preaching in the conversion of many, many precious souls. Not a few of whom had, but in recent times, been bitter enemies of Christ and were even responsible for the death of the Son of God. We find, for example, in the early chapters of the book of Acts that not a few of the priests became obedient to the faith. Over 3,000 were converted on the day of Pentecost, at a later time of an extra 5,000 were converted. When you get further on, we find Philip the Evangelist going down to Samaria, 
and preaching Christ unto them, and a revival breaks out in Samaria. And then later on you have the conversion of the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus as he was, and the gospel going out from him to the uttermost parts of the earth. It was a time of great power and great blessing, and many were the saved of the Lord. But predictably and inevitably, Satan opposed. He opposed the preaching of the word and the infant church of Jesus Christ in two distinct ways. He did so by the persecution of the messengers. In the very earliest of days, the saints of the Lord took, as we read in the book of Hebrews, the spoiling of their goods. Many of them forfeited their liberty and were shut up in prison. Many of them forfeited their lives and became martyrs for the sake of Jesus Christ. Persecution was carried out initially by the religious leaders of Judaism, and later on it became the state policy of the Roman Empire to persecute the church of Jesus Christ. But there was yet another method that Satan used to try and hinder the going forth of the gospel. Not only the persecution of the messengers, but the perversion of the message itself. It's striking how that even in the days of the apostles that there was arising even within the churches which they had founded distortions and perversions of the message that they proclaimed. For example, in Galatia, in chapter 1 and verse 7, the apostle Paul says that there are some among you who would pervert the gospel. The word simply means distort the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we find in the, in the early New Testament references being made to uh, early pagan philosophies and uh, ideas and heresies that were seeking to come in and attach themselves to this infant church of Christ and distorting the message. Gnosticism was perhaps uh, one which was very prevalent in places like Colossae and Thessalonica and Paul alludes to some of that in the messages that he wrote in his letters to those churches. Sometimes those distortions were with regard to the very person of Christ himself. And some would have denied his deity, that he wasn't truly God, and that he was a created being. And some denied his humanity, that he wasn't truly man, that he only appeared to be man. And some of these distortions were not only with reference to the person of Christ, but to the very plan of salvation, to the gospel itself. This, of course, is what happened in Galatia. And it's what provoked the Apostle Paul to write some of the most strongest, some of the strongest words that you'll find anywhere in the New Testament, where he said, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be anathema. And so you'll find that this was part of Satan's work to hinder the going forth of the gospel, the, the, the twin tactic, if you like, of hell, to persecute the messengers and also to pervert the message. Now, what was the church's response, especially to the latter one of these, the perversion of the message? The, 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 the message, uh, or the, the church's response was to call together initially in Acts 15 a great council. The council of men from Antioch and other churches and meeting with the elders and with the apostles of Jerusalem. And in, those, in that great council they debated this whole heresy whereby the law was being added to grace in order that men might be saved. And they made the statement very clear and sent out their decrees to the various churches. This has often been the way the churches responded to heresies. Even since the days of the apostles, following the pattern of the apostles, the churches in the days immediately following after their demise would often call councils together. And often those councils had as their express purposes the, 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 the necessity of defining and declaring orthodox Christian teaching. Those truths that were central as cardinal to the Christian faith. That's why we have creeds today. The early church had what are known as 
the great ecumenical creeds. The word simply means Catholic or universal. Through stated that belonged to the whole of the Church of Jesus Christ. And one of the earliest of these was what we refer to as the Apostles' Creed. I'm sure you know it. If you don't, I do recommend it to you. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Say amen. amen. That's our confession of faith. Well, I want to focus upon this morning. Having said all of that, is that confession which begins, as we say, the word creed comes from a Latin word, credere, which means to believe. Credo means I believe. Just let me just do a little sidebar for a second. There are some Christians who will tell you we don't believe in creeds. We just believe in the Bible. The Bible is our creed. But then I will say to those brothers and sisters who say that in all sincerity, well, what do you believe the Bible teaches? And they'll say, well, I believe the Bible teaches this. And I say, I'll meet you there. I've got you. Because as soon as you said, I believe, credo, you were giving me your creed. You were telling me what you believe the Bible teaches. That's, by the way, what a creed is. A creed is not something that is above the Scriptures. A creed is not even something that is on par with the Scriptures. A creed is simply the statement of what we believe the Scriptures teach. And it is part of our witness in an ungodly world. People say, you believe the Bible. What do you believe the Bible teaches? And so we say, here's our creed. I believe in God the Father and so on. And in that creed, you'll notice that among the many things that were stated, is this in almost the last words of the creed. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. My friends, this morning, this statement lies at the very heart of the gospel. One of my uh, favorite uh, programs that I listen to, used to listen to it with more regularity than I do now, but I still listen to it frequently, is a Lutheran program, and it's simply called You Are Forgiven. Sometimes the introduction to the broadcast is enough to lift my heart for the day. This is what they say at the beginning. You are forgiven. These words are at the very heart of our Christian faith. This announcement of forgiveness is good news to those who know that they have fallen short. Who know that they are not the people they should be. Who know they have hurt others. It is good news even for those who think they have done and said things that God could never forgive. How can this be? Jesus, God of the flesh, came into the world to forgive you and thereby set you free. Set, came into this world to forgive you and thereby set you free, free from shame, free from guilt, and free from death. You are forgiven. This good word from Jesus is for all who admit their need for forgiveness and trust that what Jesus did here on earth, his living, his dying, and his rising from the dead, actually provides that forgiveness, covering anyone and everyone who believes, even you. And that's the truth. I almost feel like pronouncing the benediction. That's the introduction to the broadcast. And immediately you'll see that in those very words there is a truth that, that hits home to us, that, that touches it where something within us, that raises within it a spirit of, of gladness and relief and thanksgiving and joy. You are forgiven. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. You know, our Lord Jesus Christ underscored the importance of this even before he left the scene of time. Over the last 
last couple of Sundays we have referred on a couple of occasions to his meeting on resurrection ground with his disciples as recorded in Luke 24. And in verse 47 Jesus said this to his disciples, having told them that everything that was written of him in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms had to be fulfilled, that Christ should suffer and be the first to rise from the dead. And then he said that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be preached in his name to all nations. When he instituted the Lord's Supper and communion, in Matthew 26 and verse 28, when he took the cup and he said, this is my blood which was shed for the forgiveness of sins. When the apostles began to preach on Pentecost and when the Holy Spirit began to act as they proclaimed the gospel and they were stricken to the heart, we are told. Those who listened to the apostles preaching, it says they were pricked in the heart and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And the answer of Peter was, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins. Again in Acts chapter 5 and verse 31, the apostle Peter is speaking again and referring to Jesus he said, Him has God highly exalted to be a prince and a savior, to give repentance and forgiveness of sins. Acts chapter 13 and verse 38, Peter again is preaching and referring to Jesus. He says, Through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And the apostle Paul, in referring to his calling, uh, in Acts chapter 28, as he speaks to King Agrippa, he said that God sent him to turn men from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Notice these words, that they might receive forgiveness of sins. In Jesus' ministry, and we've read this morning from one event in his ministry in Mark chapter 2, notice his first words to this paralytic man that was brought Lower died through the roof and led at his feet. Son, your sins are forgiven. Or as it is recorded in the Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. You remember the story of how that Jesus was invited to the house of a Pharisee, and Simon by name, and how that a woman who is defined by the inspired writer as a woman of the city who was a sinner comes in and she begins to weep over Jesus' feet and to wipe his tear-stained feet with the hairs of her head. And that begins a conversation with Simon the Pharisee who is incensed that such a woman would come into his home and incensed more that Jesus would allow such a person to touch him. Jesus had a lot to say to Simon. But he had this to say to the woman, he said, Your sins, which are many, are forgiven. I want to, to dwell with you a little upon this subject this morning of the forgiveness of sins. You say, why? Why? Because we must. We must. We must dwell as frequently as, he, as we can upon the subject of the forgiveness of sins because... The reality is, brothers and sisters today, that we sin every day. Every day. Our Lord Jesus, as we saw some time ago, gave us a prayer to pray. And we went through it. It's called the Lord's Prayer. And in that prayer there is this request. Forgive us our trespasses. Luther encouraged Christians to pray that at least morning and evening, and more often than that if it was possible. Why do we need to pray that every day? Because every day, brethren and sisters, if the Spirit of God be in us at all, there will be the, 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 the consciousness that we have sinned against the Lord. And when there is sin upon our conscience, there is a burden that comes with that sense of guilt. And with that sense of guilt, there is a disturbance in, in all of our lives, in, in our outlook, in our mentality, in our souls. And there is nothing that is going to get rid of that disturbance, but, but by the alleviation of that guilt. And the alleviation of that guilt can only come when we know afresh that our sins are forgiven. 
We need to deal with the subject of forgiveness constantly, not only because we daily sin, but because of the devil's attack upon us. There is perhaps no matter about which the devil attacks God's people more than the subject of the forgiveness of their sins. Is he not the, the great guilt tripper? Is he not the one who constantly reminds us of former sins, of past sins, especially perhaps of one particular sin of which we are deeply ashamed and fearful lest anyone should ever find out that we have committed such a sin? And one of Satan's favorite attacks is to keep pressing that in upon our memory and in upon our conscience and thus to remind us again and again of our guiltiness and bring shame and fear into our souls and into our lives. What is the antidote to that? It is the remembrance of forgiveness. And then, of course, we need to preach on forgiveness constantly, not only because we daily sin and have need of daily forgiveness, not only because of the devil's attack when he will constantly put us on a guilt trip, but because doubt will often come in. You know, one of the, one of the major problems, and I think any, any evangelical pastor will tell you this, one of the major problems that God's people struggle with is the problem of assurance, of, of being certain that they're really saved, of really knowing that their sins have been pardoned and that their sins have been forgiven. Sometimes that's just because of the sense of being overwhelmed just by the sheer number of sins that they have committed and maybe the, the very character of those sins that they have committed and, and they wonder how could God ever forgive a sinner like me? How could God ever forgive as many sins as this? How could God ever forgive sins that are as grievous and as heinous as the ones for which I have been responsible? And so doubt arises in the soul and perplexes the believer and destroys their peace and robs them of their joy. And once again, what is the answer to that? It is the preaching of forgiveness of sins. And so this morning I want to look with you just very quickly at some lessons on forgiveness that are seen in this narrative that is recorded for us in the Gospel of Mark chapter 2. The narrative is very interesting in and of itself. There are many aspects of this that we could look at. We can look, for example, as has often been done by preachers, at the men who brought their, who brought their paralyzed friend to Jesus. And there's lots of lessons there for us. There's lessons, too, from the reaction of the scribes to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the lesson I want to focus upon today is the lesson that is brought to us very forcibly in the words of the Lord Jesus to this man in verse 5. When he says to him, and I'll quote from Matthew 9, it says, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. Now just think of this incident for a moment or two. This man was paralyzed. I, how long he had been paralyzed, we're not, been, we're not told. How he had become paralyzed, we're not told. It might have been an accident. It might have been an illness. But he was a man who is being confined obviously to a bed. He has to be carried around. And he has been brought by concerned friends to Jesus because evidently they have heard of this miracle worker from Nazareth who can cleanse lepers and open the eyes of the blind and do all kinds of wonderful things. And hope has arisen in their hearts. And they say to their friend, we're going to carry you to this one. What is to be lost but by bringing you to him? And if he can do all of those things, surely he can bring life again into your paralyzed limbs and enable you to walk. And so they go through this whole process. They bring him to the house in Capernaum. And as always was the case in Jesus' ministry, there's a great crowd. Not only in the house, but outside the door. They can't relay it, as we would do today, into another empty room. And so they, they come up with an ingenious idea, a great plan. Mustn't have been a great plan, I think, in the man who owned the house. But in their estimation, it was a good plan. We break open the roof. 
And so they began to dig through the straw and the mud and create a bit of a stir and dust and all the rest of it. You can imagine standing inside the house listening to Jesus and suddenly all this noise and the stir and the dust and the rest of it. And soon you have a man being lowered down from the roof and he's let down at the feet of Jesus. It's very evident the man is paralyzed. There's no doubt about his physical condition. And yet the first words that Jesus speaks to this man are these. Son, your sins are forgiven. I wonder what was going through the mind of the man when the Lord said this. I wonder what was going through the minds of the four friends who had brought him to Jesus in the first place. Maybe they're, they're questioning within themselves, well, hey, that's all very nice and very good and all the rest of it, but... You know, we, we brought this man because of his physical condition. Can't you see that he's paralyzed? This, this, is the, this is the need that he has here. Why not address that need first? And the answer, my friend, is this. That the Lord Jesus Christ, in speaking these words to this man first, was underlining for us something very very important for all of us to understand and it's this it's the priority of forgiveness this man did have needs there's no question about that and by the way when our lord jesus christ speaks these words to this man without addressing it at least initially his physical condition he's not inferring by this that his physical malady and infirmity was in some way the result of sin, so that if he dealt with the sin first, then obviously the malady would clear up. You know, that, that kind of idea filter, filtered into the minds sometimes even of Jesus' disciples. It filters into the minds of Christians even today. In fact, some would even proclaim this nonsense today, that if a person gets sick, that must be because they have sinned. The Irish have words for that, but I can't say them from the pulpit. <laughs> Let's just say it's baloney and that'll do for now. You remember one time when the disciples uh, saw a man who was blind from his birth and they said to Jesus, Who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? You see the mentality, you see the way of thinking, and Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents but that the works of God may be manifest in him. So there is no suggestion here at all in the fact that Jesus first proclaims the forgiveness of sins before addressing the man's physical um, state, of, state of health, nor is there any ignoring on Jesus' part of the reality of this man's physical need. He's going to heal him in a moment or two, not... Not, not too many moments hence from this he's going to attend it and, he, and by the way brothers and sisters when the Lord Jesus Christ sends us, us out into the world we do go out with the message of hope and forgiveness but don't forget this the Lord Jesus Christ also tells us to be aware and concerned about people's physical necessities as well remember the poor he tells us feed the hungry he tells us Remember the widows and the orphans, he tells us. The Lord is, is not unconcerned about physical needs. In the early church, I said, there was creeping in at a, at a very, a very er, uh, early stage the idea of Gnosticism. Gnosticism had many features, and one of them was that the matter was evil and the body was evil, and, and those things didn't really matter. It was the spirit that mattered. My friends, that's totally contrary to the scripture and totally contrary to the gospel because our salvation is not only of our souls, but ultimately it will be of our bodies as well. The Bible speaks of the redemption of the body. We're going to have new bodies someday. We're not going to spend eternity in a disembodied state floating around in the ether. We will have bodies. Why? Because the body was created for the earth and that new body will be for this new earth that God is going to create where it dwelleth righteousness. God is concerned about soul and body. But the order here is important. 
The first thing that Jesus Christ addresses is the man's need of forgiveness. Because that's a priority. And in this service this morning, let's just pause and think about this. We all have needs. We have maybe health needs, needs in our relationships, needs that have got to do with our, uh, of our uh, ability to, to live in this world and the, the financial wherewithal to do things like that. Those are all real needs and they're not unimportant. But listen, a man can have a healthy body, he can have healthy relationships, he can have a healthy bank account, but if his sin remains unforgiven, he's in deadly danger. Old Irish evangelist W.P. Nicholson, who saw a revival in the early 1900s in Belfast, he used to say to his congregation, you know, there's only a heartbeat between you and eternity. It's all. Just a heartbeat. That's not a lot, is it? And if you're not saved this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ, do you know what that means? It means that there's only a heartbeat between you and hell. Can't you see now the question of priority? Our Lord Jesus asked the question on the days of his ministry, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What does it profit him if he has perfect health? And strength? What is it what is it profit him if all men think well of him? What is it profit him if he has all the prosperity that it is possible for a human being to have? If his soul is in danger in, in deadly danger. And so our Lord Jesus begins. As he looks down upon this man and sees the full extent of his need begins by saying these sweet words, the sweetest words that the Lord could speak to any individual. Be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. That leads me to the second thought, and it's this. Not only the priority of forgiveness, but to the prerogative of forgiveness. What does prerogative mean? It's simply a word which indicates that someone has an exclusive right or exclusive authority to do something. Look at how the Pharisees reacted, the scribes, to what Jesus had said. Verse, uh, verse uh, 6. Some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That last line. At that point, they were right. No one can forgive sins but God alone. And they would have known this very clearly because these were men who understood the law of God, who had the Old Testament scriptures. They would have been cognizant of statements such as Psalm 103 that gives thanks to God, the one who forgives all our iniquities. Other Psalms that include words like this, there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. These and other portions of Scripture make it very clear that forgiveness is God's prerogative. He alone has the exclusive right and authority to forgive sins. They would have seen that not only in the statements of the law, they would have seen it in the sacrifices of the law. And if you go through all the Old Testament sacrifices and how that the Lord ordained and set out the certain particular details with reference to sacrifices being forgiven for certain kinds of sins, and when those sacrifices were offered, then the Lord said that he would forgive their sins. But the emphasis was on God's doing. God was the one who was exercising his own divine prerogative to forgive sins. But that was the point, wasn't it? Because when Jesus said to this man, sons, your sins are forgiven. As the Pharisee said, no one can forgive sins but God. That was the point. God in the flesh was standing there among them. He was God. And he alone 
have the power to forgive sins. Friends, this morning, it stands, does it not, to common sense and reason to, be, to say that only God can forgive sins. Why? Because it's God against whom sins are committed. You say, well, what about sins committed against other people? Yes, on the horizontal level, you know, if I offend someone, I hurt someone, and, uh, and they forgive me, that, that's, a re that's a real forgiveness, and that's something that the Bible speaks about. But let me, let me think, get you to think about this this morning. When we do sin even against each other, ultimately that is still a sin against God. Why? Because it is God that forbids us to sin against each other. It's a sin against the second commandment, which says you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that is why that when David committed his grievous sin in the case of Bathsheba and Uriah, and he is brought to the point by uh, Nathan being sent in, the prophet being sent in to expose his sin, and he writes the words of Psalm 51. What does he say in Psalm 51? Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Why? David, you sinned against Bathsheba, you sinned against Uriah, you sinned against your own people because you were their king. But ultimately David saw that in it all he had sinned against his God. And friends, this morning, let us always realize that sin is against God. That's what, mean, that's what makes it so serious. That's why sin is never a triviality. It's a sin against our Creator. It's a sin against our Sovereign. It's cosmic treason, as someone has said, against God. And because we have sinned against Him, He alone has the right to dispense forgiveness. Samuel Davies wrote the words of a great hymn, Great God of wonders, all thy ways Display thine attributes divine, but countless acts of pardoning grace beyond thine other wonder shine. Such deep transgressions to forgive, such guilty daring worms to spare, this is thy grand prerogative, and in this honor none shall share. Jesus could forgive sins because he was God in the flesh. But Jesus could forgive sins also because he alone had purchased and provided the forgiveness of those sins. There was a striking connection made in the Bible which lies at the very heart of the message we preach, the connection between Jesus and our sins. He is the sin bearer. John 1, 29, the words of the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Galatians 1, 4, He gave Himself for our sins. 1 Peter 2, and verse 24, Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Hebrews 9 and verse 22, without the shedding of his blood there is no remission for sins. Clearly if he is the one who has purchased this forgiveness, he is the only one who can provide this forgiveness. That is why Peter said, and we quoted the verse already from Acts 5 and 31, that God exalted Jesus to his right hand to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So what therefore is the message? The message is this, that we are all sinners. And the forgiveness of our sin is a priority because there is no greater need than we have, that we have than that. And that the prerogative forgiveness is in Jesus Christ alone, because he is God in the flesh, because he has come to deal with the sin question, to provide the forgiveness that we need. And therefore, my friends, can you see that the, the most simple and the most obvious conclusion that we have to take from that is this, that if we are to have forgiveness, then we must go to this Christ. For no one else can forgive our sins. 
Notice not only the priority of forgiveness and the prerogative for forgiveness. Notice finally the particulars of forgiveness. Notice how the Lord Jesus speaks to this man and he says, Your sins are forgiven. It's a very personal thing. Martin Luther in his commentary on Galatians and on the statement that he gave himself for our sins says this. Make ample use of this pronoun our. Our sins. Be assured that Christ has cancelled not the sins of certain persons only but your sins. Do not permit yourself to be robbed of this lovely conception of Christ. When a person comes under the conviction of the law of God by the Holy Spirit, it is their own personal sins that deeply concern them. David said in Psalm 51, he said, My sin is ever before me. What have I got to do with judging someone else? When upon my own heart and in my own life there are sins that make me guilty, sins that require the forgiveness of God, what a wonderful thing to hear the words of the gospel, the pronouncement of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. The forgiveness wasn't only personal, the forgiveness was, in a fancy word, plenary. What does that mean? It means it was a full forgiveness. The Lord didn't spe specify this or that sin. He just said, your sins. All of them. The, the, the entirety of them. Why, why, underline, why underline the necessity of full forgiveness? Because sometimes when the law of God has done its work and the person has been brought as David was in Psalm 40 to recognize that the number of his sins were more than the hairs of his head, they wonder with so many sins as that. Could God forgive them all? Remember the words of Jesus to the woman who was a prostitute in Luke 7, 47. He said, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Sometimes it's not the multitude of our sins that troubles us, it's, it's the manner of the way we sin that troubles us. I remember reading a book by Dr. the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones on spiritual depression, and one of his chapters was entitled, That One Sin. And he was looking at all the various reasons why people can get into not clinical, but spiritual depression, depression of soul. And as he speaks about it in that particular chapter, he gave an instance of a man who had come to faith in Christ during his ministry, a man who was quite well on in years, had lived a, a life as a sinner, but God in his grace brought him under the sign of the word and saved him, and he says he was rejoicing, and we all rejoice with him. And he says, but the next day, he says, I did not came to my door, and it was the same man. What a change. His joy seemed to have gone. The sense of relief that he had expressed the previous evening seemed to have evaporated. And he says, as I began to speak to him, I discovered that there was one particular sin that had come to his memory that he felt God could never forgive him for. I'll tell you what it is. There's no easy way to say this. Forgive me. But on one occasion he was blaspheming and he, he actually used the expression Jesus Christ is a bastard. And that came home to his heart with great force that he had said such a thing. And he said while he believed that God for, could forgive him for a hundred thousand other sins, there was a sin that was so grievous that there could be no forgiveness. And so Satan had used that to rob the poor man of his sense of forgiveness and relief. And he says, I sat down with him. And I turned him to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. And what does it say? 
the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. From all sin. And no matter how heinous the sin is, and, and you know, I am sure that in every congregation and every group of people listening to the gospel, that there are people sitting there and that they, they hear this, this talk about forgiveness of sins and they, in general terms and in the abstract, and then they remember something that gnaws at their memory, that gnaws at their conscience, that shames them, that drives them, as it were, into a position where they would almost rather commit suicide than that that sin should be known by other people. And when you proclaim the forgiveness of sin, the enemy will come along and say, yes, you're right. It was grievous. It was heinous. It was hellish. It was hell-deserving. How do you think there could be forgiveness for that? I've got one answer for that, my friend, and that's to go again to the cross. And simply to ask myself my question as I stand under the shadow of Calvary and witness the suffering of the Savior, to ask myself this question, did Jesus Christ make a little sacrifice for little sins? Or did he make a great sacrifice for great sinners? Is there a sin that the blood of Christ cannot cleanse? Are we not guilty of diminishing its sufficiency and its power when we look at our sin and say, this is beyond forgiveness? Oh, my friend, all manner of sin and blasphemy, Jesus says, shall be forgiven unto men. And I love the way that John Bunyan, the great Baptist preacher who spent 12 years in Bedford jail for preaching without a license, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, you know, he preached a great sermon called The Jerusalem Sinner Saved. Who was the Jerusalem Sinner? The Jerusalem Sinner were the people of Jerusalem who had stood in Pilate's judgment hall and said, Crucify him. He said, These were the very people who had the very blood of our Savior upon their hands. And yet on the day of Pentecost, as Peter preaches the gospel to them. And they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? These same Jerusalem sinners, as Bunyan put it, they were washed in the same blood that they had helped to shed. That's still true today. You can know the full forgiveness of sin. You say, how can I, how can I, how can I know that such, a, such forgiveness it is available to me. If I go to Christ, you pointed out my necessity of forgiveness, that it's a priority above everything else, that Jesus Christ alone is the one who can forgive sin. If I go to him, will there be any hesitancy in him, any reluctance in him? You know, it's striking when you look at the story before us in Mark's Gospel, chapter 2. That we're not even told that the friends who brought their paralyzed colleague to the Lord ever said anything or made a request or that the man himself made any request. Jesus looked upon him as he lay there and he said, he said, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. That's how desirous he is to forgive. It's not something that has to be forced out of him. It's not something that he has to be pressured into, that we have to twist his arm to give to us. It's something that he does, my friends, with joy. Why? Because it is the very fulfillment of the mission for which he came into the world. His name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. What I want to get across to all of our hearts, my own included this morning, is this, is that when we go to Christ for forgiveness, he does not give it with reluctance, but with joy. And he can do it for you this morning. I'm thinking of the story of the prodigal in Luke 15. And you know it all well, I'm sure. And you remember how that when he had squandered his, his inheritance with wine, women, and song in the far country, and he's reduced to beggary, and he's eating pig swill to keep himself from dying of hunger, and he decides to go home, and he rehearses 
his penitential speech. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto my father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no more worthy to be called your son. And then these words, make me as one of your hired servants. Why in the world did he ever say that? Or ever think to say that? Make me a hired servant. Why? So that I can earn some money to pay you back. Some, some, some people can't get rid of it. And I say some people, all of us, myself included, can't get rid of this notion that there's some way or another that we can do something to appease God, to pay him back. You notice what happened when the father saw him? And he says to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. The father cuts him off. He doesn't get to say, make me a hired servant. Because the father falls on his neck, and he kisses him, and he says, fire up the barbecue. We're going to have a party. My son's home. That's the way Jesus forgives. That could be yours today. I believe in the forgiveness of sin. Do you? Not just Peter's sin, David's sin. Do you believe in the forgiveness of your sin? That all the atonement that was needed to pay for it has already been paid. That when Jesus said it is finished, he meant what he said. And the forgiveness which Jesus Christ gives today, he gives freely. And with all the joy and passion of his heart. Therefore go to him. Go to him. If we confess our sins. I said a few weeks ago there are five short prayers that I pray every day. There's another one I'll add to that. And it's one that's very familiar to you. The Greek Orthodox Church use it in their liturgy. And it's based upon the prayer of the public. And it's simply this. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, be merciful on me, the sinner. You know what Jesus said about that man? He went down to his house justified. You can know that blessing today. The alleviation of a guilty conscience and the fear of meeting God and the fear of eternity dealt with why? Your sins are forgiven. And if you go to the Lord today and just say that prayer, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, the sinner. Do you know what he'll say to you? Son, daughter, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. Hallelujah.